nanohub.org. Uh, today we're continuing on with this discussion of frequency modulated AFM. And uh, I thought today I would focus a little bit more on the experimental details uh, uh, to sort of complement what I discussed in last lecture. So uh, if you were here last time, uh, what we did is we tried to give you some sense of the fact that the frequency of a cantilever will shift uh, from its resonance value when the shape of the potential well that it oscillates in starts to acquire non-symmetric uh, uh, aspects, non-symmetric terms. And for the case, uh, to apply that to the case of atomic force microscopy, we ended up with this formula that was uh, first derived by Sater and Jarvis, which is really the fundamental formula for frequency modulated AFM. And it basically says that if you locate a tip at some equilibrium position d star from some arbitrary position d equal to zero, and if you then allow that tip to oscillate with an amplitude A about that equilibrium position, uh, over time the tip will sample the, um, the well, uh, the, the tip sample interaction force uh, uh, potential um, in the way that I've drawn. Uh, how, much the, how much of the interaction force is sampled, of course, depends on the amplitude A of the cantilever. That's something that experimentally you can control. And uh, what Sater's formula tells you is, it tells you what the, what the magnitude of the tip sample interaction force is at the minimum separation of the tip from the substrate. So that's what this formula at the bottom of the slide tells you. And that tip sample force interaction at the minimum separation between the tip and the substrate, that's related to the amplitude of the oscillation of the cantilever, and it's also related to the frequency shift of the cantilever as it moves from a position far from the substrate to this position D star. So in Sater's formula, this, uh, this uh, dummy variable C that's what's integrated over, and uh, it's integrated from the minimum value, minimum separation distance between the tip and the substrate, all the way out to infinity. Right now, it's integrated out to infinity to make the integral a little bit easier to handle. Uh, the point is, the further away you get from the tip sample surface, the, the interaction force goes to zero. If the interaction force goes to zero, then this parameter capital omega, which is the fractional frequency shift, right, is a function of z. That fractional frequency shift also goes to zero. So pretty much there's very small contribution uh, uh, when you integrate past values of, of, d, of, of z, of, of c, uh, greater than, let's say, d star plus a. Now this formula has a couple of important parameters. One parameter is the spring constant of the cantilever. That's the multiplicative factor in front. There are three terms in the integrand. The first term in the integrand is the term that's appropriate for small amplitude oscillation. That, that uh, constant one in the integrand is multiplied by the, uh, the fractional shift in the frequency, capital omega, right? And that is just a small amplitude formula that was derived uh, at, the, uh, at the end of last, or wasn't derived, it was presented at the end of the last lecture. As the amplitude gets larger, these other terms start to contribute. Uh, the third term in this expression represents the, uh, uh, the contribution when the amplitude of oscillation becomes large, when the tip amplitude uh, starts to become large. Uh, the term in the middle is kind of like an interpolation term that bridges the gap between small amplitude and large amplitude. But what this formula tells you is that if you systematically do an experiment where you position the tip at a certain value of d star, and if you happen to know the amplitude of oscillation of the cantilever, then you can infer what the tip sample force is at the position d min. Right? And so by systematically moving the cantilever closer and closer to the substrate, measuring the amplitude and frequency shift at each value of C that you stop, 
uh, you eventually can map out uh, the tip sample uh, interaction force. So all these theories that we were discussing early in the semester, where we had Van der Waals forces, we had DMT, we had Hertz contact, all these models for the tip sample interaction force, those models can in a certain sense be validated uh, uh, with this, this FM, AFM approach. That's why it's so interesting. So you say to yourself, well, that's, that's cool, that's, that's, that's worth doing. The question is, how do you actually do it experimentally? And uh, that question was asked uh, in the era, let's say, mid-1990s, and a variety of groups worldwide started to investigate how to accurately measure the frequency shift the shifts of cantilevers, and how to do that is basically going to be the topic of the lecture today. Um, there should be a few uh, obvious requirements uh, that are needed to, to, to make this experiment work. One is you need reasonably high stability, because as you slowly move the cantilever closer and closer to the substrate, uh, you don't want drifts between the substrate and the cantilever to set in. So you need to have a, a reasonably stable system such that you can systematically approach the sample uh, with the cantilever uh, and not be uh, uh, plagued by thermal drifts. Right? So these experiments take a little bit longer uh, to perform than, let's say, the, the typical uh, uh, constant amplitude experiments that that we've discussed in tapping mode AFM. So that's the reason why the high stability uh, is required. The frequency shifts that occur as the cantilever comes closer to the substrate, those frequency shifts are small. They're on the order of uh, uh, maybe a tenth of a percent to a few percent of the frequency of the can of the of the natural frequency of the cantilever. So if the natural frequency of the cantilever is 100 kilohertz, you're often measuring maybe one hertz shift out of 100 kilohertz, or two hertz shift out of 100 kilohertz. So you need a technique to accurately measure um, frequency shifts, and we'll discuss that a little bit. There's very good ways to do that now. And then the third thing that should be uh, reasonably apparent after the homework set that, that you've already uh, uh, gone through Right, is you want to avoid this jump to contact that occurs when the slope of the uh, tip sample force uh, interaction curve, when the slope of that matches the slope or matches the spring constant of the cantilever. Right, when that slope of the tip sample interaction force matches the cantilever spring constant, then that red line is tangent to. Uh, the, the tip sample force at some particular uh, tip sample separation. And when that occurs, there are two stable solutions. There are two stable positions of the, of the tip, right? Uh, the tip can then jump into contact. And you clearly want to avoid that if you're trying to measure the tip sample interaction force uh, as a function of, let's say, tip sample separation. So one way to, one way to do that is to pick a cantilever with a really sp stiff spring constant. If you pick a cantilever with a really stiff spring constant, then the, the, the cantilever uh, uh, F versus Z curve indicated by that Z, by that green line in this diagram, that will only intersect at one point along the tip sample force. And if it only intersects at one point, then there's only one stable solution for all tip sample separation. So you, don't, you avoid this jump to contact that we discussed uh, uh, earlier uh, in the amplitude modulated AFM part of the course. So these are three requirements that, that knowing what you've already been through in this course, you probably might have been able to surmise, right, is, is requirements in order to pull this frequency modulated AFM experiment off. So the... The new idea that, that emerged, uh, again, in the, in the mid-1990s was to abandon the traditional cantilevers, the traditional micro-cantilevers that, that were commercially available at the time. The reason those cantilevers were abandoned was because their spring constants aren't stiff enough. Uh, 
and they also do not possess the necessary stability uh, to allow these experiments to be conducted. Um, I'll try to explain that in a little, little bit more detail later on. Um, in a number of groups in the world, in particular uh, uh, Franz Giesbel in, in uh, Austria, came up with the idea of using these tuning forks uh, as cantilevers, right? And tuning forks have a lot of advantages over commercial, commercial cantilevers. The first advantage is uh, they're made by the millions, right? And everybody has a tuning fork in their wristwatch to keep time, right? So most wristwatches today use tuning forks. This idea goes all the way back to the 1960s when this, co this watch company, Bulova, uh, marketed this watch called the Accutron. It was a revolutionary watch at the time. It was based on a tuning fork, kept very accurate time over days and days and days. Before that, you were constantly resetting your, your wristwatch because it was hard to maintain a, an accurate frequency or an accurate time standard internal to the wrist wristwatch, but that changed in 1960. And if you open up your wristwatch and look, you'll find a little canister buried inside, uh, and that canister contains a tuning fork. So if you carefully ex ex cut, cut away the canister, pull it away, you'll find a tuning fork uh, with electrodes on it, pretty much like the, the pictures that I've got shown here. The advantage of the tuning fork is, one advantage of the tuning fork is that it's extremely cheap. They're about 25 cents each. So you can go to any electronic company and you can buy 50 or 100 of them and you're going to pay just a few dollars. And the reason they're so cheap is because they're sold, they're used everywhere in the world for wristwatches. Uh, they're also used in your computers for timing, right? They, they're an extremely accurate time base. The cantilever that's probably most interesting for frequency modulated AFM is a, or the tuning fork that's most useful for frequency modulated AFM is a tuning fork that's been uh, designed to operate at a frequency equal to 2 to the 15th hertz. Right? 2 to the 15th hertz is about 32 uh, kilohertz. And this, this then, this, this, this frequency is then used as a clock frequency for many electronic circuits, right? So the data that I'll show you today is based on a, on a 32 kilohertz tuning fork, but in principle, you can buy tuning forks that have a variety of different frequencies. It just depends on the design of the tuning fork itself, right? So this is kind of like uh, everything you wanted to know about tuning forks in one lecture. Tuning forks are made out of quartz, right? Quartz is crystalline SiO2. And um, apart from silicon, I think quartz is the second most, uh, 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 is the second material in the U.S. by, by uh, 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 weight that's made every year, right? Silicon by far is the leader. But after that, I think quartz comes in. Uh, close second. And the reason quartz is so interesting is because it's a piezoelectric material. So the piezoelectricity, if, you, if you're not from material science, right, you don't have a material science background, but piezoelectricity means that if you push on the quartz, charges develop on the surface of the quartz due to the mechanical stress that you uh, impose, right? And so it's a way of coupling mechanical forces to electricity. The phenomenon was actually discovered in the 1880s in France well, using quartz crystals. They just noticed that if they uh, took a quartz crystal and placed weights on the crystal, a voltage would develop across the plates, across the, uh, the faces of the quartz. Right? That was the first, first observation of, uh, of piezoelectricity. Right? Since then, we've learned an awful lot about quartz. We know it's a, it's a, it can be made in a crystalline material. If it's made in a crystalline material, then it can be oriented. And this piezoelectric behavior that translates force into voltages, right, that can be optimized by identifying the appropriate axes, the appropriate crystalline axes in the quartz single crystal. 
So it turns out there are three uh, important axes in quartz and single crystal quartz. One axis is referred to as the mechanical axis. In this plot, that's referred to as the y direction. There's an electrical axis referred to the x, direx, x direction in this plot. And then there's a optical axis referred to the z direction. Now, the, the optical axis has a threefold rotational symmetry associated with it. Right? So every 120 degrees, if you rotate the crystal every 120 degrees, you basically have the same, uh, same crystalline structure. Right. Uh, the optical axis isn't so important for piezoelectricity. What is important is the, the, uh, the x and the y axis. And so what this diagram is, it is trying to show you is that if you uh, put pressure, if you squeeze the, the quartz crystal along the y axis, then uh, a voltage develops across the faces oriented perpendicular to the x axis. And that's just, the, the or, those orientations are just experimentally determined. So once you know those three crystallographic directions, then you can start to cut quartz wafers uh, from the single crystalline quartz. And the uh, orientation of these various quartz wafers have been optimized for different purposes, right? Depending on the slab, the thickness of the slab that you cut, that controls the resonant frequency of the quartz, right? And depending on the orientation of the quartz crystal, you can get longitudinal or shear stresses that develop when you apply a voltage uh, across the uh, electrical axis. Or conversely, if you apply a force along the mechanical axis, you can get you can get voltages along the uh, the x-axis. Right, so it turns out the tuning fork, right, the, the optimum orientation for the tuning fork is shown in this, in this diagram. And so all the tuning forks in the world are somehow cut from single crystalline quartz to have this orientation with respect to the X, Y, and Z uh, crystalline uh, axes. Okay. And there are millions of these things produced, right? There, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mammoth industry. Uh, why is quartz so useful for AFM purposes? Uh, actually, why is it useful for frequency standards, right? The reason it's so useful for frequency standards is that depending on how these quartz crystals are cut from the single crystalline quartz, they can be basically, their dimensions can be made basically immune to small changes in temperature. Right? So those different cuts that were shown in the previous slide, those cuts were determined by uh, insisting that once the crystal is cut with that orientation, you don't want the dimensions of the crystal to change very much as the temperature changes by, let's say, 10 degrees. Right? If the temperature doesn't, if the, if the dimensions of the crystal don't change much with temperature, <clears throat> then clearly is the temperature of, let's say, your wristwatch changes as you go from inside a classroom to outside where it's cold, right? If the frequency doesn't change much, then it keeps accurate time. That's the, the, the basic idea. Um, and of course, when you apply that, that concept to AFM technology, it basically means that you don't need to wait for a long period of time for your cantilever to stabilize, right? It's reasonably immune to, uh, to temperature uh, drift. And that's illustrated in this, in this graph here, which compares the change in frequency uh, divided by the resonant frequency of quartz and silicon over a narrow temperature range around room, room temperature, right? So experimentally for these quartz crystals, uh, right, the, the, the change in frequency with respect to a small change uh, in temperature is on the order of 0.04 parts per million per degree centigrade. Right, 0.04 parts per million per degree centigrade. And if you compare that to silicon, uh, the effect is quite striking, right? So variations in temperature of these quartz tuning forks by let's say plus minus 10 degrees barely changes the resonant frequency. And if you compare that to, let's say, a silicon microcantilever, right, the, the effect is quite stunning, right? The, so the silicon, the results from silicon are shown by the dash line. So there's real good reasons to choose quartz 
to do frequency modulated AFM, right? And in fact, it's surprising to me that cantilevers, conventional cantilevers, aren't fabricated out of quartz, because if they were, they would be a lot more stable. I think the difficulty is it's just hard to attach tips to quartz cantilevers where with silicon, it's very easy to do that using uh, the microelectronics etching technology that's that's evolved over the last 50 years. So quartz is great; it's thermally stable. Uh, if you cut a piece of quartz into this tuning fork geometry, which I indicated schematically over here, uh, it's important for you to apply voltages uh, to that tuning fork in such a way that you cause the tuning fork to oscillate in one of its two uh, primary modes. So there's a symmetric out-of-phase mode and then there's a symmetric in-phase mode. Uh, most tuning forks are cut with electrodes that cause this in-phase mode to, be, uh, to, to uh, be excited. And the way that's done is it's done by carefully wrapping electrodes gold electrodes around the quartz tuning fork in the way that's indicated in this diagram. So there are two, uh, uh, two electrodes shown schematically. One is labeled one, the other is labeled two, right? And if you apply a voltage V1, two, uh, between those two electrodes, uh, the electric fields that are set up inside the quartz crystal are designed to, to excite this in-phase oscillation, right? So that's all, that all comes uh, prearranged for you. That's all been worked out 50 or 60 years ago, right? So it's a really neat package because <coughs> the uh, in-phase mode of oscillation where the, the tines of the tuning fork oscillate in phase one with respect to another, right? That motion is excited at the frequency omega of the voltage that you apply. Now, if you just pick any old arbitrary voltage, or any old arbitrary frequency and apply a voltage between the tuning forks, the, the amplitude of this motion is gonna be very small, right? What you need to do is you need to find the resonant frequency of the tuning fork. And the resonant frequency of the tuning fork is gonna be controlled by the dimensions. So L, W, and T, right, the dimensions of the tines of the tuning fork will then allow you to adjust uh, where this resonant frequency occurs. And as I said earlier, the tuning forks that, that I like for AFM applications, those tuning forks have been cut, have been designed to produce this two to the 15th hertz oscillation, this 32 kilohertz oscillation. So the, the prediction is that if you apply a voltage at this 32, kilohertz frequency, this two to the 15th hertz frequency, then the tines of these tuning forks will oscillate back and forth with high amplitude because you've reached the resonant uh, frequency of this particular structure, right? So tuning forks have tuning curves just like regular cantilevers do, right? You have to sweep the frequency of the applied voltage your AFM controller has to be able to uh, pick out the uh, amplitude of the quartz, of the tine of the tuning fork. It has to be able to measure that amplitude, right? And when you reach this resonant frequency, the amplitude of oscillation will be a max. That's the resonant frequency, and that's the frequency that you're going to use when you do AFM experiments, just, just like when we did amplitude modulated AFM. So there are many similarities. There are many similarities. So what does the vibration spectrum look like? So these are some of the data that, uh, that one of my students, Chin, uh, took while he was here at Purdue. Um, the tuning forks, when you buy them, are encased in this little canister. And this canister usually is, evapor is evacuated, so there's, there's no air inside. And the reason they want no air inside is because they don't want any damping of the tuning fork by uh, uh, viscous damping due to the air. So if you just buy the tuning fork commercially and you apply a voltage, you sweep the voltage, measure the current through the tuning fork. So the tuning fork now becomes an electronic device. 
and you actually measure the current that flows through it, you find that the current that flows through it is maximum at this 32 kilohertz. It has a very high, uh, a very sharp resonance compared to uh, an amplitude modulated uh, silicon cantilever. So AM, AFM cantilevers used for intermittent contact uh, AFM experiments. The, the Q factor, that resonance, is on the order of a few hundred. Q is a few hundred for a conventional silicon micro cantilever. These quartz, these quartz tuning forks, because they're crystalline, very, very few defects. Right? It's single, it's single crystalline SiO2. There are very few defects. The tines that oscillate, okay, are considerably thicker than the, the thickness of a silicon cantilever. So that means that the energy loss to the supporting structure of the tuning fork goes way down, and as a result, the Q goes way up. So if you eliminate this damping due to air, right, you end up measuring Qs that are on the order of uh, 64,000, right? Six, right, really large. Uh, when you take the tuning fork out of the can and you run the tuning fork in air, Right, the frequency downshifts a little bit. It's indicated by the red curve. Right, why does it downshift? It downshifts because there's added mass now to the tines of the tuning fork due to the air molecules that surround it. If you add mass to the tines of the tuning fork, it shifts the the resonant frequency to lower values, and also the the Q of, this, of the tuning fork drops. It drops by about a factor of 10, but it's still on the order of 9,000 in air, operating in air. And you compare uh, a Q factor of 9,000 to a silicon Q factor of a few hundred, right? you can clearly see that there are going to be huge advantages, uh, for instance, to measuring the position of the peak in that tuning curve uh, as, let's say, uh, uh, the tuning fork is brought closer and closer to a substrate, right? So the sharper the Q uh, of the resonance, the easier it is to measure small changes in frequency. And of course, that's what we need to do for frequency modulated uh, AFM. So, um, the, the model of the tuning fork that we've used in our lab is this Raltron uh, R26 tuning fork. Uh, these are the parameters that, that we measured uh, by taking one of the tuning forks out of its can. Uh, we've inferred a spring constant of about 12.7 kilonewtons per meter. This should be compared to the uh, spring constants of 40 newtons per meter that are typical for intermittent contact uh, AFM cantilevers. So this is a really stiff cantilever compared to the cantilevers that we've dealt with in the past, right? Uh, but we need that stiffness because that basically means that the tip that we're going to attach to one of the tines of this cantilever, this tip is not going to jump to contact. It's not going to exhibit the spy stability that conventional AFM, AFM cantilevers exhibit. That's a that's also a huge advantage, right? So, um, the resonance that we measure experimentally is now no longer measured by a beam bounce, a laser beam bounce technology. So, another distinct advantage of these quartz tuning forks is you can throw away that laser diode, right? You can throw away the, the, photodiode that collects the laser light that bounces off of a conventional silicon cantilever. You don't need that anymore. This quartz tuning fork is like an electronic uh, circuit element. And what you do is you can sweep the voltage across the electrodes of the tuning fork and you can measure the current that flows through the tuning fork. And when the current that flows through the tuning fork has its maximum value, then you've reached the resonant frequency of the tuning fork. You do not know, you no longer need to direct the laser beam off the cantilever. Huge advantage if you're trying to do experiments in vacuum, right? Because if you're going to do experiments in vacuum, you have to worry about 
the outgassing of the uh, the photodiode. You have to worry about outgassing of the of the laser diode that's used to illuminate the cantilever. Here, all you have to do is uh, put the tuning fork inside of a holder, insert the holder into a vacuum chamber. You're going to need two electrodes, two 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 wires coming out, right? So you eliminate all the hassle uh, with uh, with lasers uh, to to pull this off. So what this is a plot of is the plot of the current through the tuning fork as a function of a voltage. It's probably about 5 or 10 millivolts applied to the tuning fork. We just very systematically vary the frequency of the voltage. We see a very nice peak in the, um, in the current that flows through the tuning fork. Currents are on the order of 50, 60 nanoamps. Right? This peak has a funny shape to it. It's not... It's not governed by the physics that was described for the resonance of a, of a silicon cantilever, right? So the resonance of a silicon cantilever is governed, the shape of the resonance of a silicon cantilever is governed by the way that silicon cantilever is excited. There are two modes of excitation. One mode of excitation is you, is you cause the base of the cantilever to vibrate at a fixed frequency and you vary that frequency and measure the response of the cantilever, right? That's called the base excitation mode, and that base excitation mode gives rise to a certain characteristic resonance line shape that we've discussed about a month ago. The other mode of oscillating a, a standard silicon micro cantilever is to coat it with uh, iron, uh, iron film using an external magnetic field to cause the, the micro cantilever to oscillate. And that mode of excitation causes a characteristic line shape also. We discussed that about a month ago. This quartz tuning fork produces yet another characteristic shape for the resonance curve. It has uh, a sharp peak, but it also has a, a very shallow minimum on the far side of the peak. And the reason this uh, curve has this shape is because it's uh, an electronic component. Right? And electronic components or electronic circuits can have various shape resonances. Um, basically, what's happening is the current through the tuning fork peaks when the impedance of the tuning fork reaches its minimum value. Right? And this anti resonance, this shallow uh, dip in the resonance curve uh, at frequencies greater than the resonance frequency. That occurs when the tuning fork has its maximum impedance. Right? And the reason a uh, tuning fork can have a minimum and a maximum impedance is because the circuit model for the tuning fork involves two parallel branches, as I've indicated schematically in this picture. The upper branch is, is, a, is mo the upper branch that models the actual tuning fork uh, itself has a capacitance, an inductance, and a resistance that have to be determined for each tuning fork that you use, for each class of tuning forks that you use. If, if the equivalent circuit for the tuning fork were just related to that upper, upper branch of the equivalent circuit, uh, that anti-resonance would go away, and the tuning fork would have a nice symmetric uh, resonance curve. But there are always some parasitic capacitances floating around. Those parasitic capacitances are modeled by this, this capacitor C sub P, and that capacitor C sub P is in parallel with the, the lump models, uh, the lumped electrical models for the tuning fork. And it just basically means a current through the tuning fork can occur in two different paths. Okay? And when the current through the upper path and the bottom path, when the, when those two currents are in phase, right, then the impedance is a minimum and the current through the, the tuning fork is a maximum. When the current through the bottom path is uh, precisely 180 degrees out of phase with the current through the top path, right, then the impedance of the tuning fork that the, that the applied voltage sees Right? That impedance is a maximum, and that means that the current through the tuning fork is a minimum. 
right? So whenever you see a resonance curve in an electronic circuit, right, the take home message is, at least whenever I see a, a resonance curve in an electronic circuit that has this peak followed by this shallow minimum, right, that's telling me that the equivalent circuit has to be modeled by two parallel paths, right? <clears throat> when the current is flowing through those two parallel paths, and of course the, the phase of the current with respect to the applied voltage, that shifts in, in interesting ways that has to be worked out uh, in detail uh, by solving, solving for the uh, uh, impedance of this equivalent circuit as a function of frequency. So our electrical engineers in the audience, they know how to do that very well. And uh, when they do it, you can, you can reproduce the shape of that resonance curve uh, very nicely, right? So all these fine details, right, are, it's, 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 it's reasonably important to at least appreciate uh, where they come from, right? You see these things when you do the experiments, but what you then have to do is go home at night and try to understand um, what, what produces those features. Um, it's very easy to eliminate this parasitic capacitance, right? So that, that anti-resonance feature is, is, uh, could be uh, uh, confusing when you're trying to interpret data. So it's useful to try to eliminate it, and one way to eliminate it is to build a compensating circuit uh, I indicate schematically how, how we did that uh, when Shin did his PhD work here at Purdue. He basically built a simple op-amp circuit with a, uh, a, an adjustable capacitance in the lower leg. That adjustable capacitance can be changed to null out the effect of the uh, parasitic capacitance, which technically you don't know, right? You can't, I mean, ahead of time, you don't know what that parasitic capacitance is going to be. So you have to put in an adjustable capacitor. You have to tune that adjustable capacitor. And as you tune that adjustable capacitor so that you uh, uh, eliminate the, the parasitic capacitance, then you can recover a very nice symmetric resonance curve. And then once that's set, right, that, that, then you can use that very symmetric resonance curve to interpret any experimental data that you get. It just simplifies, just simplifies the interpretation of the data. So that's also been implemented in the, in the uh, course of the experiments that I'm going to show you at the end of this lecture. Uh, it's a fair question to ask, how do you calibrate the amplitude of the tuning fork tying as a function of the applied voltage? Right? You can measure the current that flows through the tuning fork as a function of the applied voltage. And you can do that at different frequencies, but how do you actually measure the, the amplitude in nanometers that the, the tuning fork oscillates at? So this problem is equivalent to the problem of converting the voltage in the position-sensitive photodiode, right? You want to convert that voltage to a, a displacement in nanometers, right? So we talked a long... I think there was a whole lecture devoted to that calibration in AMAFM about a month ago. You have to go through a similar calibration here, and the way we did it uh, was to build a simple laser interferometer, right? And um, the idea is sketched in the bottom right-hand panel of this slide. This laser interferometer basically takes infrared light. It directs it through a small fiber optic, that small fiber optic is placed a small distance above one of the tuning fork tines. Right? There's an intensity I that comes through that tuning fork, or, or comes through that fiber optic, and that light is then reflected at two points, uh, two places. Uh, one place is the end of the quartz uh, fiber, and uh, that's indicated by the back arrow labeled R2. So some of the light that, that's contained in the fiber optic is reflected at the interface R2, and some of it actually emits uh, into air and then is reflected uh, by the top tine of the tuning fork, and that's indicated by the, the coefficient R1. And depending on the separation of the fiber optic from the tuning fork, the relative phases of R1 and R2 can be varied. 
And if the relative phases of those reflected light can be varied, then you can set up an interference, right? a standing wave interference in this optical interferometer. And that standing wave interference then shows up as a, a voltage on a photo detector uh, that's indicated in the upper left-hand region of this, uh, this diagram. So uh, the idea is you, you, you buy one of these commercially available uh, laser photodiodes or, that, that, that run at about 1,300 nanometers. These are, these are used for all types of uh, communication purposes, so they're really cheap. Right, this fiber optic interferometer you can buy that for a few hundred dollars from any, uh, uh, almost any optical uh, uh, science company, and you can set up one of these interferometers to actually calibrate uh, small changes in the position of the uh, tine of the tuning fork with respect to the fixed position of the end of the fiber optic. Right, so that's that's the basic idea behind it. Uh, the implementation is pretty straightforward, and what you find is that if you <clears throat> if you mount your tuning fork, I think I illustrate this on the previous. Right? If you mount your tuning fork on a little piezo tube, as indicated, then by applying voltage to the piezo tube, you can you can systematically move the tuning fork up and down with respect to the fixed position. Uh, of the fiber optic end, right? And so <clears throat> as you apply voltage to the piezo tube and you look at the voltage of the photodiode, right, you get a curve that looks something like this, where it goes through maximum and minimum. This is your interference minimum and maximum of the light that's reflected from these two surfaces, right? And it turns out that the separation between the maximum of, of, of two points on this curve uh, is just precisely lambda by two, where lambda is the wavelength of the photo diode that you use to to uh, to run the uh, the fiber optic interferometer. So that number is known with very high precision, and that allows you to calibrate the position between two peaks in this interferometer. Right, that two peaks is 655 nanometers, and then that allows you to put a voltage on the tuning fork and watch how the voltage on the photodiode changes, right? So as the, as the position of the tuning fork tine with respect to the end of the fiber optic, as that position changes, this black dot will move up and down uh, on this sinusoidal curve. And how much it moves up or how much it moves down can then be calibrated because you know the separation between these two peaks is 655 nanometers. So by doing a sequence of calibration curves, uh, you, can, you can actually calibrate the amplitude uh, of the tuning fork tine as a function of the voltage that you apply to the electrodes of the tuning fork. And you can get that calibration as precise as you, as you believe the, the 655 nanometers of, of your uh, laser photodiode that you use in this fiber optic interferometer. Once you know that number, right, once you know how many millivolts applied to the tuning fork corresponds to how much amplitude uh, of oscillation of the tuning fork, once you know that number, then you're, you're, you're fixed, you're set, right? That, that's the important calibration number. And what we've, what we've learned is that uh, once you calibrate a tuning fork, its calibration remains very, very reproducible. Uh, you can, you can buy dozens of tuning forks from the same company. You can check the calibration of dozens of tuning forks, one with respect to another. And not surprisingly, they're all, the, the calibration constants are all the same. So once this calibration is done very carefully in, in a lab, Right, that calibration number can be, then be used uh, with pretty high confidence to characterize the displacement of a, of, of a tine of that tuning fork, same model number, same manufacturer, right? That you, you got it licked, right? You got the problem solved. You don't have to calibrate every tuning fork that, that you use. Once you know the number, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty, uh, 
uh, pretty good for all tuning forks of that model. And of course, the reason that's true is because there are so many of these tuning forks made. They're all made identical, one with respect to another. Right? All these problems that you have with the silicon micro cantilevers, that kind of just disappears. So there's a lot of advantages. Um, so the next thing you need to do, right, to implement this FMA-FM experiment is you need to attach a tiny tip to the bottom end of one tine of this tuning fork. And the way we did that was we actually snapped off a conventional micro cantilever, and we then, uh, using a viscous glue, we then stuck that a small amount, right, a small amount of viscous glue, allowed us to stick the uh, uh, a conventional AFM cantilever onto the bottom tine of a tuning fork. And so therefore, we were able to produce uh, essentially a, a sharp tip mounted on the end of a tuning fork. That sharp tip can be resonated now at 32 kilohertz. We can achieve uh, Q factors in air of about 9,000. And we're now in a position to allow that tip to approach a substrate. And we're going to measure small frequency shifts uh, in the resonant frequency of the tuning fork due to the interaction of that tip with the substrate. <coughs> so that's the idea. That's the idea. I'll say that commercially, these, these tuning forks uh, come pre-mounted uh, on ceramic plates. So this is an example of uh, uh, the so-called Q-plus sensor that's available uh, from uh, Franz Giesbull's company. Right? Giesbull pioneered these tuning forks in frequency modulated AFMs. He, he, uh, he started a small company that sells these tuning fork sensors. And so you can see here what you get when you buy a Q-plus sensor. It's a, it's basically your quartz tuning fork with electrodes uh, plated on it in the appropriate way to cause this, this motion of the tuning fork tines. There's a, a sharp tip mounted on the end of the tuning fork. And this then mounts into the head of an AFM in such a way that the tip is pointing down towards the substrate. Right? So then you have to approach the substrate towards the tip using all the techniques that normal AFMs use, and you now are in a position to measure the shifts in the resonant frequency of the tuning fork due to the tip sample interaction just by measuring the current that flows through the tuning fork. You no longer need to use this laser to bounce off the tine of the tuning fork into a photodiode. It's, it's, a, all a, it's, a, it's an electrical measurement now. It's much, much cleaner. How do you measure frequency shifts that are small compared to, let's say, a, a reference frequency of 32 kilohertz? How, how would you do that experimentally? So this is probably the most important slide of the lecture because it, it tells you about phase lock loops. So if, if you don't know about phase lock loops, let me tell you, they're pretty amazing little pieces of electronics. Uh, they became uh, commercially viable in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, with the advent of, of, of integrated circuit technology. And what they basically do is they take a signal that's noisy and sinusoidal. So you have an input signal that may have noise on it, but it oscillates at an amplitude A. It's got a certain frequency omega, and it's got a an unknown phase, phi, right? You don't know what that phase, and you don't know what that frequency omega is. And the purpose of this phase lock loop is to produce an output signal that has a frequency and phase that exactly matches the input frequency and phase that you do not know, right? And of course, you want to do this in a short period of time. So you need a, a feedback loop that automatically adjusts uh, uh, omega naught and phi naught until the match between omega naught and phi naught and omega and phi are very good. And then once that match is good, you want that, that 
phase lock loop to track small changes in frequency omega, small changes in phi, automatically in a feedback mode. Right? You don't want to have to go and measure on a frequency counter what the new frequency is. You just want a signal that comes out which tells you what that new frequency is. And that's what this phase lock loop does. It involves three components very briefly. It involves a, a phase detector which is labeled P sub D. This phase detector compares a reference frequency from a voltage control oscillator. It compares that reference frequency to your input frequency and it produces a DC output that's proportional to the phase difference between those two signals. And the phase lock loop is instructed, it's programmed in such a way as to make that DC output go to zero. When a DC output goes to zero, that's telling you that the input frequency, omega naught, in input phase phi naught from this voltage control oscillator matches exactly the omega and phi of your unknown signal, right? And so this DC voltage is then passed through a filter. The filter tries to get rid of the noise. That output of the filter is then fed back into a voltage control oscillator. This is a chip that you can buy. If you put a DC voltage into the chip, it produces a sine wave with a frequency that's proportional to the DC voltage. Right? So it takes a DC voltage in and it gives you a frequency out. The frequency out depends on the DC voltage in. Right? So this all can be, be done in a feedback loop, feedback loop um, mode of operation. Uh, and basically what happens is you put your input frequency in, you turn the feedback loop on, you activate it, and within a second or two, you hope you get a lock condition in which the omega naught and phi naught are now locked to omega and phi. And if omega and phi varies with time for whatever reason, right, this feedback loop is instructed to change omega naught and phi naught in order to keep this lock, right? So the omega naught and phi naught, that's something that you can measure, right? That's a clean signal. You can measure that with a variety of different techniques. And in this way, you're ensured that you know what the input omega and the input phi is, even though it may be a very noisy signal, right? So it's a really cool technology. I have a whole bunch of notes that if you're really interested in this, you can read. I don't think it's worth uh, going through that, but it, it tries to summarize the important features of these phase lock loops. One of the assumptions, I'll say, is that you're assuming that the frequency shift of omega is not very large, right? So if the frequency shift of omega is factors of two or three, this phase lock loop is not going to work. It will not be able to track those large of change in frequencies of omega. But if the frequency change in omega is a few percent, right, then these phase lock loops have a, a dynamic range that allows them to track those small frequency changes. It also assumes up front, these phase lock loops also assume up front that you know roughly what the input frequency is, right? So you can't just put any old frequency in. You got to know that it's an input frequency within a certain range. And a certain range is determined by the way the, the, the feedback loop and the phase lock loop works, right? So you need to know certain things, but once you know those things, right, you need to know the in, roughly the input frequency, and you got to know that the input frequency doesn't change much during the course of an experiment, then these things, the, these things really work well. To do this with accuracy, I will just mention that you need a 24-bit uh, voltage-controlled oscillator, right? You can't use 8-bit, 12-bit, 16-bit. That, that won't give you enough accuracy. So one of the problems of implementing this is that these uh, voltage-controlled oscillators have to have like a 24-bit precision signal put into them. That means that the voltage that goes in has to have 24 bits of control. Otherwise, you won't get the, you will not have the ability to uh, uh, determine very small frequency shifts. So that's another uh Another, another thing that has to be known when you use these. 
But but once you have that phase lock loop in place, then you're you're in business. The phase lock loop is basically part of this feedback, this PI feedback loop mechanism, right? We've described our tuning fork. Uh, we've put a tip on the end of the tuning fork. We drive the electrodes of the tuning fork with an AC voltage source. That AC voltage source is adjusted so that the frequency of that voltage source is very close to the resonant frequency of the, of the uh, tuning fork. So the, the tip attached to the end of the tuning fork now oscillates at this 32 kilohertz, right? And <clears throat> what we do is we basically drive the substrate towards the tip and we try to do a variety of AFM type experiments, right? So there are basically two modes of operation, two modes of operation for these frequency modulated AFMs. The first mode of operation is uh, use the frequency of the tuning fork as your feedback parameter. And as you scan the tip over the substrate, the interaction between the tip and the substrate will cause small changes in the resonant frequency of that tuning fork. And what you would do is you adjust the position of the substrate with respect to the tip to keep the frequency, the resonant frequency of the tuning fork fixed. Right? So these are referred to as constant frequency images. And the feedback, the feedback parameter is the frequency of the tuning fork. You, 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 your, your, your feedback controller does whatever is required to keep the frequency of the tuning fork fixed as you scan over the substrate. And in the process of doing that, you basically are mapping out a constant frequency image of the substrate. And it turns out, as I'll show next lecture, right, these constant frequency images of substrates that if the substrate is atomically flat and well prepared, these images are capable of, of, of uh, atomic resolution. So you can actually see individual atoms on a substrate uh, uh, with this constant frequency imaging technique. Now it was thought that the reason you could see atoms in frequency modulated AFM, right, it was thought that 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 feature of FM AFM resulted or was a, was a consequence of the fact that the resonant frequency of the tuning fork was very sharp. Right? So you recall I, I mentioned, I commented, uh, uh, tuning forks in air have Q factors of 9,000. If you put them in a vacuum, the Q factor increases to 50 or 60,000. So that means that the resonant curve is extremely sharp and that allows you to track very small frequency changes with high precision. That's, that's, what, that's what a sharp resonance curve translates into. And so the standard argument has been for many years that you see atoms with frequency modulated AFM and you routinely, if, you're, if you run these things in ultra-high vacuum, you routinely, you routinely see atoms. It's not like you just see them once a day or you know, once a month. It's, they're always there. Right? The argument has always been that capability is related to the high resonance or the high Q values of the resonance for a tuning fork. That wisdom is being challenged now because various groups around the world are starting to show that if you do amplitude modulated AFM experiments carefully, you can also see atoms, right? It's just you got to know the right way to do that. So uh, I think there's still a debate in the literature about uh, the important features of FM AFM versus AM AFM in, in atomic resolution. That's a, that's a story that's still evolving. And there may be a lecture at the end of the semester that tries to describe that current state of affairs. It's a really interesting, really interesting problem. So this is, this is one mode of operation. It's this constant frequency image. If you come back to the next lecture uh, on Thursday, I'll show you some really spectacular pictures that, that various groups around the world have achieved using this. The other advantage of these FM, AFM tuning fork uh, mode of operation is that you can do this, a, this, this force spectroscopy. 
Right? This is something that's really interesting to, uh, let's say, physicists because if you can, you can measure the shape of that tip sample force, if you can really measure it, then you can start to directly compare uh, the tip sample force to these simple models that we, we discussed uh, back at the beginning of the semester that involve Van der Waals, DMT, Hertz. Right? So to me, this is, this is really a cool way to check the validity of those models to see if, if, if they're at all uh, 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 useful. And it's a very direct way of checking, right? There are many ways to check the validity of these models, but a lot of those checks are very indirect. Right? This is a direct way because you directly measure this tip sample force by measuring the frequency shift and amplitude as you bring the cantilever from far away closer into the substrate. So this is Sater's f famous formula, right? So I just, just to, to end uh, the talk, right, I, I'll show you some data that, that uh, we acquired here at Purdue back in the, oh, maybe five, four or five years ago now. Right. This this is the result of attaching a sharp tungsten tip to the tine of one of these 32 kilohertz tuning forks, and basically implementing this force spectroscopy mode of operation. And so, what I show here is I show the amplitude of the tuning fork in the upper left panel of data. I show the uh, frequency shift that we measured using these phase lock loops for this tuning fork as this tungsten tip was brought closer to uh, uh, a highly oriented pyrolytic graphite substrate. And I show measurements done for different amplitudes of oscillation of the tuning fork taken over a period of about five or six hours. So the experiment was repeated more than once, right? It was repeated many times over the course of a day. We tried to, we tried to uh, uh, investigate different amplitudes uh, of oscillation when the tuning fork was far from the substrate. We investigated large amplitude oscillation of the tuning fork. So the amplitude of oscillation of the tuning fork in our experiments uh, was on the order of, of 7 to 10 nanometers. It was pretty large compared to the tip sample interaction forces. Right. And the curve on the bottom panel of this slide shows what happens when you take those data curves in the upper panel of the slide. You use Sater's formula to interpret the data, right? When you interpret the data, you then directly get out the tip sample force as a function of the minimum separation distance between the tip and the substrate. And I, I think it's reasonably clear that uh, the data is reproducible. It, it, it scales properly with different amplitudes. Uh, you can take data a few hours apart, and the tip sample interaction force uh, is, 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 is pretty reproducible uh, during the course of, a, of an experimental run. So this is a direct measure. Right. This is a direct measure of this tip sample force that we've been discussing uh, for, for over a month. You can try to understand that data by fitting it to uh, the standard models. And, and I just illustrate the fit that, that we were able to achieve here. Uh, we, we selected uh, the Van der Waals force. We, uh, for the contact mechanics, we selected the DMT force model, right? You can see the Van der Waals force uh, gives a very good fit to the attractive regime of the tip sample interaction force. Um, we, we selected the cutoff parameter A0 of about 0.3 nanometers, right? That's a parameter that has to go in uh, to uh, Van der Waals. We also had to select the Hamacher constant an effective modulus of the tip substrate, effective radius of the tip. Right? You do all that, you use the, the values that we list, you can, you can get the, a reasonably good fit to the Van der Waals force. Right? <clears throat> the DMT model is shown in the upper right-hand portion of this slide. Uh, 
It's indicated by those solid dots. If you add the DMT model to the Van der Waals model and subtract it from the data, right, you get a difference. The difference that's left over we refer to as a chemical force, and it's indicated by that, that small smattering of points uh, uh, that deviate from zero uh, for separations less than 0.5 nanometers. So it turns out this DMT plus Van der Waals force allowed us to fit the data reasonably well. There's a small discrepancy, uh, um, but uh, the discrepancy is really, really small compared to the overall uh, uh, quality of the data. So I think that's the end of what I had to say today. It's It's just kind of a how to build a frequency modulated AFM. It tries to emphasize, I tried to emphasize some of the technological uh, features of this FM AFM that kind of make it interesting. So if you, you're experimentally inclined, right, you may have a better appreciation of, uh, of how these things work and, and how you might go about building one. If you come back to the next lecture, I'll talk about, I'll show you some of the spectacular data that's been generated uh, throughout the world using this FM AFM technology, right? And so you'll see lots of pictures of atoms uh, in the next lecture. So I think I'll stop now, and if you have any specific questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Yeah? So <clears throat> when they do atomic resolution images and so forth, is that normally in air or liquids? In F, okay, so in FM AFM, the primary community is ultra high vacuum academics, right? So most of the images that I'm going to show you uh, in the next lecture have been achieved, have been taken by doing frequency modulated AFM in a very clean ultra high vacuum chamber. The surfaces have to be atomically clean. The surfaces have to be atomically flat, because if they're not, you're going to have difficulty uh, resolving the atoms. That's also why you have such a high K or stiffness, is because you can make the amplitude very small as well, correct? Uh, the, the, what's, what's, what's coming out of the recent literature is that as you shrink the amplitude of the oscillation <coughs> of the cantilever of the tip, as you make the amplitude of the tip oscillation smaller and smaller, it becomes a little bit easier to achieve atomic resolution, right? So what you basically are doing is you want to make the tip amplitude oscillate in this very nonlinear tip sample interaction force. And that tip sample interaction force is essentially uh, five or six angstroms in extent. So the tip amplitudes that scientists are using now to achieve these atomically resolved images, those tip amplitude oscillations are sub-nanometer, right? They're actually picometer tip amplitudes. Uh, and that basically means you're allowing the tip to roll back and forth sinusoidally in that very nonlinear potential well, right? So I think, I think the early data that achieved atomic resolution, they used larger amplitude oscillations, but as time has gone on, the emphasis has been to decrease the amplitude of oscillation of the tip, make it smaller and smaller. The tip will not stick to the substrate because the K of the cantilevers tend to be very high, right? Tend to be very high for this FM, AFM, right? Yeah. And how much vacuum? Well, we could do we could do a whole lecture on ultra high vacuum technology, but you're basically talking ten to the minus ten tor, right? So if you have if you have a surface of metal in air and you somehow clean it off within microseconds, there's a monolayer of air molecules that coat it again, and those air molecules prevent you from seeing the underlying substrate with any great precision. So if you want to make the time it takes for these, these molecules to reabsorb back onto a surface, if you want to make that time hours rather than fractions of a second, 
you have to reduce the pressure to ultra high vacuum. Ultra high vacuum, I think, is technically defined as anything below 10 to minus 9 torr, but if you can get 10 to minus 9, you can usually get 10 to minus 10, right? So uh, 10 minus 10 is, 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 is a good pressure to be. Right? And these tuning forks are great because they are compatible with ultra high vacuum. Laser photodiodes, right? These position sensitive detectors, the lasers themselves that, that you use for a beam bounce technology, those tend not to be compatible with ultra high vacuum. If you put those inside a vacuum chamber, you'll never get 10 minus nine tor. They outgas, they're, they're made out of plastic. So you have to do different, you have to use different technologies. Right, to, to do UHV. It takes a lot longer to do a UHV experiment. It's not something you just do on a weekend. <laughs> so, but I hope you'll, you'll agree some of the results I'll show next week are pretty, or next lecture are pretty spectacular. So there's at least a few groups in the world that have the money and the infrastructure to do those experiments, right? Very expensive. Very time consuming. Okay, so maybe we can assign a homework problem that should all be able to go home tonight and build an FMAFN. Right? That's what the goal is, right? If you don't know how to build them, then you don't know how to use them. Right? Okay, thanks. We'll see you Thursday. <laughs>